Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Who is Preston John? Dragons on the wall. Free Phoenix, man. Of course, we got the new drop hoodies, man, with the new letters, man. Just had to give y'all the new looks, man. What it do? You already know I'm rocking mine. You already know I'm rocking mine, man. Oh, feeling good, man. Feel strong, man. You feel powerful, man, when you're rocking your vibration slogans, man. We call them vibration slogans because, you know what I mean, when people read them, they vibrate right away to it. They might have a question. It might be like, who is Preston John? Then you get to, you know, open up about the last noble image of the Negro. You're going to see how much you've how much you've learned, you know what I mean, when, when someone asks you who Preston John is. We're going to see if you've been surfing the wave, taking the surf the wave challenge. You've been in the Presta Hour, man. We're on, like, episode 33, live on the radio in the ether with the Presta Hour, man. So you already know what's popping, man. You already know how to talk about Presta John. You already know how to say, look, man, this is King David, baby. I'm repping King David. You already know how to talk about Phoenix, man. Fort Tryon State Park, Upper Manhattan, the last great American dragon. Free Phineas, man. Free Phineas the Negro. Free the Negro, man. So rock your vibrations, Logan. We got many more to come. We're going to hit tie battle with those Dodge Your Own Hijack shirts, man. The Choose Up, Stay Up, Suit Up, Choose Up shirts, man. Surf the Wave, Hijack Free. All that's going to keep going so that our water keeps flowing. And a hop to everybody who's already hit us up, man. Sold us out the first shipment. So we got a whole new one in now. Get them while they hot, man. Because we going to keep them, you know. Keep them flowing, man. You know what I'm saying? You order them, we're going to drop them on you so that you can rep and feel good. Whether you're at night just getting cozy or you're walking around you in the gym or just doing your thing, man. You can also get the mugs. You're going to put the mugs up soon. You might be, you know, in a, in, a, in a business environment. You might need to carry around your mug, man. You got the hats. You got the beanies. Man, we're gonna, you know what I mean? We're just going to keep it flowing, man. Go also support Aqua Vanessa's GoFundMe. Go support Aqua Vanessa, Shea Butter, Hair Butter, all that's in the drop shop right now. Crystal James Jewelry, CJ Battle, you know that crystal piece I got with the uh, copper wire. That's CJ Battle, man. Make sure you hit up crystaljamesjewelry.com, brothernature.com, living well. Man, hit up the drop shop, man. Hit up uh, Paco, Paco, the Paco Kings oil, man. Know how to vibrate with that cedars. We just, you know what I mean, putting out our creativity, you know what I mean, our design, and you know what I'm saying, we know that as a community, when we support each other, ain't nothing else, you know what I'm saying, that we need. Ain't nothing else we need but our own support. You know what I'm saying, so you have got us this far, we got our family, man, this far, man. Now our family is business minded, now our family is getting ready to buy land, man, getting ready to build the land, you know what I'm saying, that we already got. That's how we thinking right now, not like, you know, oh, let me just buy this temporary thing. We, we we buying for the everlasting, man. We investing. So when you support our drop, you support us being able to, you know what I'm saying, put money in the right pot, man. You know what I'm saying? So that we can continue to do what we're doing, keep our lights on, keep our software packages, everything we need for our live radio, keep our, uh, you know, music uh, licenses current. That stuff costs money. Our website costs money. So this is stuff that we do month, be out of our own pocket. But your support goes a long way to keeping our lights on, keeping those logs going into the fire, man. So hitting y'all with the looks, man. Speaking of the looks, man. Speaking of the looks, man. I mean, you already know, man. Who's pressed the job, man? Who is pressed the job, man? I dare somebody ask me who pressed the job is. I dare you, man. We're going to have a sit down. We're going to have a conversation. This, this book got it started, though, man. This book popped it off for us, man. Lost Tries and Promised Lands, Ronald Sanders. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this chapter right quick. I'm out of here, man. You know, I'm going to let y'all keep flowing. Hit y'all with a nice quick one, man. Again, hit those links below to keep the water flowing for us. We're going to go to chapter 29. Slavery Comes to North America. Okay, now you're gonna have to read this from the perspective of already being here. And who they bring in here off the boat ain't you. It's someone coming from another world, okay? 
and they're going to make a distinction between these people. They're going to call one Indians, and they're going to call the other Negro. All right. Sorry, I'm on daddy daycare, man, so don't even trip. Let's get it. Let's go. So slavery comes to North America. The notorious sentence relayed to us by Captain John Smith from the journals of John Rolfe about the last of August, 1619. So this 1619 is popping off there. Here comes slavery business, right? But I thought Columbus rolled up in 1492. So what were you doing from 1492 to 1619? What were you doing from 1492 to 1619? You were at war. You were at war before that. All right. So when they suddenly say, oh, here, here comes slavery, they're issuing in their own, you know what I'm saying, you know, cargo off the boat onto the Indian that they're calling Indian that's already here. So about the last of August, 1619, came in a Dutch man of war that sold us 20 niggars, right? <laughs> niggars. Like, niggar. <laughs> I can't make this up, man. He received more attention than it can answer to, and one of the questions most often raised about it has been what precisely was the status of those 20 blacks? when they were sold in Virginia as slaves, pure and simple? Or what was much more common there at that time as indentured servants? Historians who have argued for their status as indentured servants have mainly been motivated by the desire to absolve the South of having plunged into a slave system single-handedly and without hesitation before any other English continental colonies even existed to collaborate in the guilty work they can find strong circumstantial support for their government for their argument the 20 blacks arrived more than two decades before we have any distinct signs that slavery was obtaining a foothold in Virginia on the other hand Jamestown almost all almost as soon as it became entrenched and developed tobacco as a cash crop had begun a large-scale importation of indentured labor. Now, my naga, you already here. So why do they need to import people for labor? Was it because you weren't about to be doing that shit? Is it because the naga here was like, mm, we don't make good slaves, you see? We're warriors. We fight. We fight for the Holy Land. They knew they couldn't make the same people that's fighting for the Holy Land slaves on their own land, could they? Let's keep reading, man. On the other hand, Jamestown, as soon as it became a cash crop tobacco, right, had begun a large scale importation of indentured labor of men and women bound by contract. So now they're bringing people onto your lands as indentured servants. Okay? Specifically because you weren't about to be doing that. Alright? The indented shape of the preparations at which it was torn in two halves is what gave it a popular name. To serve for a limited period of years, usually about five, that was to remain throughout the colonial period so they were volunteer slaves man they're getting on boats voluntarily so you had to say you know how do you hijack a whole nation of people and put them on a boat and they voluntarily come over here it's because they did volunteer to come over here and you are already here throughout the entire Americas why couldn't they just make you you know what I'm saying do all the labor you know what I mean of course Eventually, you got you got this Willie Lynch, you know that how to break how to break a naga, right? So then they, they got to figure out the witchcraft, the sorcery of how to break down the real Indian. Meanwhile, people are volunteer volunteering for this, <laughs> so to speak. All right, let's go. Almost as significant 
as a means of obtaining workers in the South as the slave market was. Furthermore, in 1619, almost all of the buying and selling of labor in the colony was still being done by the Virginia Company rather than by private individuals. If this was the case with the 20 blacks, right? The 20 blacks, they're not talking about the Indians. They're not talking about you. Let's go. Then, then isn't it more likely that they were the company's indentured servants rather than its slaves? Let's go. But these questions, though important, do not really deal with the problem of the genesis of slavery in North America, for there is one thing about which we can be fairly certain. Those 20 blacks have been a cargo of slaves, had been a cargo of slaves while they were aboard the Dutch ship, and Virginia had nothing to do with this. No matter what they began when they stepped off the gangplank, the Negroes had arrived from the West Indies, according to all indications, as offerings of the international slave market. So they were bringing them in from where? <laughs> Africa or the West Indies? The Negroes had arrived from the West Indies. So when you were put on boats, a lot of times, like we read in the, uh, the African or African-American Red People book, saying that they would put you on a ship from Mississippi to Florida and then tell you you came from Africa. tell you, tell the children they came from Africa when they just got off a boat from Mississippi to Florida. And now you put that in your psyche as a young child, oh, I came from a whole other land, and you tell your children the same thing when someone just lied to your face or lied to your great-great-grandmama's face getting off the boat from Mississippi or the West Indies. The Negroes had arrived from the West Indies, but the fact that the Virginia colony was now dealing with the market does not have to be viewed as a sin for the future South manifest manifesting itself early. It was rather an established sin of New World commerce accepted by Englishmen as far back as John Hawkins when there was no Virginia yet and inevitably reaching the shores of another colony where labor was in demand. Virginia was the first Anglo-American colony to receive black slaves. What do you mean? Niggas is already here. What do you mean receive black slaves? Nagas is already here. The definition of an American is the copper color races found here by the Europeans. Click the link below. 1828 Webster Dictionary. Copper colored tribes already here. Copper colored tribes already here. But now they're bringing in the Estebanico, the Azamore. Let's go, man. After all, Massachusetts Bay now love to carry Mayu. We broke down some of this Cape Verde drop live in the ether, man. Go surf the wave of Caramello every Monday, 7 o'clock, Pacific, man. Let's get it. After all, Massachusetts Bay, the next English continental colony of major size, did not hesitate to enslave Pico, Pico Indians, Pico Indians. And he got on the Pico, Pico, and trade some of them for black slaves when the moment came to do so. As we know, furthermore, it is fairly clear that there was black slavery in the colony well before then, perhaps from the very beginning. William Wood, writing his New England's Prospect in 1634, tells in an antidote about a black moor in the colony who was brought back to his master after a mishap in the woods. So they call him a black moor in 1634. This is not likely to have been an indention servant. Samuel Maverick of Chelsea was known by 1638 to have had Negro slaves for some years, and it is entirely possible that he, arriving in the area of one of Sir Fernando Gorges' men in 1624, owed some of them even before the mass owned some of them before the mass colonization began in 1630. So 1630 became a mass 
colonization, man. All right, these low documented, low documented examples need not have been the only case. In fact, for it is well known that some of England's Puritan leaders had no objections to slavery. In principle, in 1635, Emmanuel Downing of Salem, Jerusalem, Salem, wrote to his brother-in-law, John Winthrop, about new troubles that were then brewing with the Nara, Naragansets. Naragansets. Now, this is all in Massachusetts, all right? Naragansets, they call it. If upon a just war the Lord should deliver them into our hands. All right? They're praying for you. Or these moors to be delivered into their hands, right? If just, if upon a just war the Lord should deliver them into our hands, we might easily have men, women, and children enough to exchange for moors. Exchange for moors? That's confusing, right? Let's keep reading which will be more gainful pillage for us than we conceive. So, who are they referring to now? Who will be more gainful to them? Who do they want to exchange in for mores? Let's see. For I do not see how we can thrive until we get into a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business. For our children's children will hardly see this great continent filled with people, so that our servants will still desire freedom to plant for themselves. Don't let these Nagas want freedom, man. We need enough slaves for our children's children. Remember the Papa Boo, the descendants, but now applies to the successors, to the descendants, to our children's children right so now the children's children can walk around and say i'm not racist it's all good look man let's just have peace but you still eat everything you have is based on this system that was set up for you that destroyed the same people you want peace with now you saying peace is all good for the wordplay but these people need their things back again it's a very simple analogy man my grandfather has a house your grandfather breaks into the house rapes his wife kills my grandfather and puts the kids in the basement he takes over the house with his kids and now my grandfather's kids are in the basement. My family's in the basement of our own house. Now generations go by. His family really thinks it's his house now. They've been living in the house for generations. They don't even care about the sin of the grandfather that stole it. Low key, they're happy he did it because it gave them a life. Folks can talk all day about Columbus, but low key, most white people love this shit because it gave them a life. It literally gave them a new world to go to. They walk around like they own the place because of this privilege, this manifest destiny. It was our destiny. Our God brought us here. Now, I need you to accept our God as your God who enslaved you. Right? Our God has favored us over you. Why? Because they know that your creator has favored you, Amos 3. Only you, of all the families on the earth, have I known. You are my seed. So we're still in the basement, but it's our house. Now we get up, we rise up, we, you know, take take over the house, and we crazy. You take my, my granddaddy's watch, it's still my granddaddy's watch, even if he's passed it into your family. But you don't want to give the house up. We say, you know what, we want our house back. You say, well, we're not racist. Nah, man. We love black people. But we ain't gonna give you this house. Our granddaddy got it fair and square. Matter of fact, we know it ain't fair and square. We know he stole it all. We know he broke the commandments of the creator. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. 
thou shalt not bear false witness and call us savages when you know we got the oldest kingdom on the earth. But we can be Christians and cover all that shit up because Jesus died. He died for the sins of our fathers for murdering you. Are we supposed to accept that? On our own land, in our own house. The definition of an American in the Noah Webster Dictionary of an American is the copper. Is the copper colored Nagas found right here in their own house, put into the basement, slaughtered. Don't complain about it, you're a rebel. But my house, don't complain about your house. Get back in the basement forever, perpetual slavery. This is madness. Accept the madness, it's our madness. We come from the sea, we took your house. But we're not racist, but we're damn sure not giving you this house back. That means there's a part of you that agrees with the transgression. And if you agree with the transgression, you will be judged with the transgression. And you know that deep down inside. America's tribal. America's tribal, man. Who was Preston John? America's tribal. We gotta put that on the shirt next, man. America's tribal. Hashtag drop nation. Hashtag hijack free, man. Let's go. So he's saying, if, if upon a just war the Lord should deliver these Nagas into our hands, we might easily have men, or actually, you know, whoever they're fighting, because now they want to exchange them for Moors, right? So which would be gainful pillage for us, more gainful pillage than we can conceive. So something about getting these moors is more gainful than they can conceive. Until we get into a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business for our children's children so that they can live in the house like it's their own. Let's tear all this stuff down and re and, and, and just make concrete and steel skyscrapers and, and just crap no nature don't grow anything no one can grow anything uh let's spray all the skies let's poison the skies poison the crops let's do all this stuff to the corn right here and say that we're not parasites say that we're not a virus spreading across the earth destroying the earth and the people that are already here on their own land in their own house you're throwing them in the basement and now i feel i feel for you you know what i'm saying some of my some of my, uh, you know what I'm saying, non-melanated people, I, I feel for you because you, you wake up and you're like, damn, my ancestors did all that. I don't even know how you feel. I can't even empathize because my ancestors aren't fucked up like that. My ancestors don't go around jacking people's entire land. Why? Because they already have their own by birthright. They don't have to be jealous of themselves. This is Judah, baby. This is Mexico. This is Jerusalem. Now we're supposed to be confident in what we have. That ain't bragging. That's telling you who I am. Everywhere I walk, when I step, I know I'm stepping on my land and it's a good feeling, you know what I mean? It's a bad feeling to wake up and say, damn, I don't own shit by birth. I gotta own it through paperwork. I don't got no birthright. Not here. I better find some land that I can have a birthright for because I ain't got no birthright. I better make something up. I better take some titles. Let's go. I better enslave some people. <laughs> so one can find, man, so they say we need to get a stock of slaves sufficient to do all our business for our children's children. Our children's children will hardly see this great continent filled with people so that our children will still desire freedom. Our servants, excuse me, our servants will still desire freedom. With no shit, we desire freedom. Cause something about perpetual slavery just don't jive with us, man. Something about perpetual slavery don't jive with me, man. You know what I mean? Let's go. 
so that our servants will still desire freedom to plan for themselves and not stay, but for great wages. So you're going to want great wages, right? Because you don't want to do this for free. Nobody want to be a slave for free. You want great wages. And I suppose you know very well how, how we shall maintain 20 more cheaper than one English servant. Obtain 20 more is cheaper than one English servant. Let's go. One can find no more vivid presentation of the reasons why white planters prefer slaves over indentured servants. As for the preference for Moors over Naragansets. Naragansets is an interesting word. Right? Naragansets. Read it. Pause it. Pause it, read it. So they prefer Moors over the Nara God sets. Colonists everywhere seem convinced by now that Negroes were hard, harder workers than Indians. So the invaders, the colonists said, you know what? These Negroes that we're bringing over here from Africa are working harder than the Indians on their own land. Well, why? Because the Indians are fighting you. That's why in the Papa Boo, you know, we know we're, we are the prisoners of a war. We're not slaves. We're the ones that you killed off until you either got tired of killing or just wasn't popular no more. Let's go. Negroes were harder workers than Indians. And besides, it was inviting trouble to keep Indians captive too close to their native habitats. What did we just say? They couldn't enslave you on your own land. It was dangerous, man. Why? Because you knew the terrain. How are they going to enslave you? How are they going to put you in a jail that you know the jail better than the, the warden? If you know the prison better than the warden or the COs, you're going to run the prison. It's dangerous. That's how we know. All right? That's why they, they were taking us from here, bringing us to Europe, taking us from here, bringing us to Africa, or bringing us to some other island somewhere else that we didn't know as well. We didn't know the, the energy, the vortex. It's like Harriet Tubman. You think Harriet Tubman knew all the drop and she wasn't from here? You think Harriet Tubman got off a boat after three months somehow survived and then had to drop on the underground railroad or the underground tunnels. You know what I'm saying? Come on, man. She only had to drop because she's native and this is her land. And what they say, it's dangerous. It was inviting trouble. It was inviting trouble to keep Indians captives too close to their native habitats, man. They had to switch you up. That's why Genghis Khan was switching people around. If in the long run, then New England provo proved far more resistant than the South to a mass influx of Negro slaves into the colonies from where? Africa. Let's go. This was hardly owing to any superior moral scruples about slavery. James Truslow Adams had made the celebrated point that the difference was simply a matter of landscape. And if the respective e economies that the soil would yield in New England and in the South, this certainly is true to a large extent, but another factor besides physical geography may be found in the differing cultural geography, geography of North and South, as we have seen the South in general, of which the American South was marginally and ambiv ambivalently apart was less resistant to a racial varied social environment than the North was. And one, if one wants to judge the 17th century American South on its racial record, its relationship with the Indian, 
should be considered alongside with that of the Negro. Because if you're talking about color, you're talking about one and the same, except one is just now arriving here and one is already here. It's a tribal war. The Negro was badly treated everywhere and with being and was being enslaved everywhere but relations with the Indian in English America was nowhere so good relatively speaking as in Virginia Maryland and even the Carolinas after they were founded in 1600s as if to prove her hesitant her hesitancy to become an aggressor against the Indians Virginia so they were hesitant to be aggressive against the Indians as to prove her hesitancy to become an aggressor against the Indians, against the indigenous Naga. Now, even with these folks getting off the boats, some of them is also us. We know that too. You know what I'm saying? Because in Africa, those tribes were selling off the Hebrews that were there. Right? So now they go from there to here, and it's the same thing. You know, some of them are acclimated. Some of them, you know, are not. You know what I mean? Some of them or, 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 you know, connected to these other tribes more. Either way, it's a difference. They're making a distinction, this Negro versus this Indian. But we know either way we're talking melanated people. And some of them are coming off, you know what I'm saying, with these volunteer slavery, these indentured servitudes that they would serve for five years and they cool, or this and this, that. So, you know, not all this slavery was one, you know what I'm saying, one stroke. It was very case by case, you know what I mean? Very much case by case. All right, so let's get it. New England, on the other hand, was perfectly capable in 1640s of entertaining thoughts of having the Indians rooted out. <laughs> so Boston said, man, let's get all these, all these real Indians out of here as being of the cursed race of Ham. Come on, man. Come on, man. So that's the same little lie today. Oh, you guys are just, you, you guys are cursed. We're cool. You know, we're over here, you know, breaking the, com breaking the commandments, killing and stealing. We get no sun over there. You guys get all the sun, but you're cursed. We have no gold. You guys got all the gold, but you're cursed. We want all the things you have by birthright, but we're not the cursed ones for not having it. You're the cursed ones for having everything. You all must be hammocks. <laughs> oh man, dodge your own damn hijack. We gonna put it on a shirt, man. Dodge your own damn hijack. And yeah, man, those hoodies are super cozy, man, because it's getting breezy already, man. So, you know, get them while they hot, man. Get them while they hot. So New England, on the other hand, was perfectly capable in 1640s of entertaining thoughts of having the Indians rooted out and being of the cursed race of Ham. According to John Winthrop, this is a rare instance of that notion of ra racial taint being applied to the Indian. Racial taint. They're letting you know the Indian is a Negro or a Naga. You know what I'm saying? But more often, such a notion applied to blacks for New Englanders, too, among whom a certain kind of middle-class pro Protestant descended from men like George Best was at home in northern landscape and climate, was alien to the kind of extrava extravagant blood that Samuel Seawall, all right, we've got that Samuel Seawall selling a Joseph, who, you know, he literally said, man, how are you going to be treating God's people like this? These are the people of the first Adam. The first Adam. Go get that cell in the seawall, that uh, cell in the Joseph by Samuel Seawall. Love to let us find the truth on that one. Samuel Seawall was to refer to a, a sit in the 1700s. It was significant that John Saffin, the Massachusetts slave owner against whom Seawall directed the anti-slavery polemic in which he used this term, really agreed with his opponent on what was perhaps the central issue. Saffin, 
said he could accept the abolition of slavery in the colony provided that the owners be reimbursed and that the Negroes be all sent out of the country. <laughs> mm. So does that make sense that they're bringing you in while they're trying to send you out at the same time in the 1600s? Or were they bringing another group in specifically that didn't know anything about this country and trying to send the ones that were too dangerous to be here because they knew their habitat and it's dangerous to enslave a person on their own damn land. <laughs> so they wanted you to all be sent out of the country or else the remedy would be worse than the disease and it is to be feared that those Negroes that are free, if there be not some strict course taken with them by authority, man, we gotta, we gotta put our foot on their neck. They will be a plague to this country. Whoa, what country? Time out, man. Take a tea, man. You're talking too fast. Uh, Saffin, Saffin, you're talking too fast, man. You mean the Naga is a, is a plague? In Dragon Land? America, the land of the dragon? The Maru Khan? We're a plague to our own land? No, we're a plague to your ideology of perpetual servitude. That shit is madness, man. That's parasitic, man. You're on somebody else's land calling them a plague on their own land. Y'all need counseling for this, man. Y'all need counseling for this, man. That's asinine. You, you just, normal people don't do this type of stuff. I'm gonna I'm take over. I'm gonna go in your house and call you a plague in your own house. That's why we dragons on the wall. And when we free Phoenix, please believe we have a wall of protection. Free Phoenix, man. I ain't gonna call, I ain't gonna call us a plague on our own country and then say we curse. Come on, man. It's crazy, man. Y'all gonna make me. Y'all gonna make me just bust through this wall, man. You know what I mean? I'm just gonna turn invisible like David and start walking on water, man. Hope y'all got that drop. Yeah, man. We got that drop, man. King David turned invisible and walked on water. <laughs> we just talking about, uh, Man, what was that drop? That was the uh, Benjamin up to Doula, man. Get that out the drop library. Go to page 17. David L., the leader of the Jews, king of the Jews, King David, turned invisible and walked on water after rising in three days when he was put and given a life sentence in a dungeon. He was given life, right? So he was dead. He, he was given life. If you put somebody on on life, th their life is over. If they serve in life, you took their life away. They've been excommunicated from life, right? <laughs> so David was given life in jail and then miraculously in three days, he shows up in the king's court. Like, what it do? King is like, I, ins I put you, I ended your life. I put you in jail for life. How did you get free? He said, with wisdom. Then they went after him turn invisible they can only hear his voice they tracked him to the banks of the river and he took off his shawl or he you know threw his shawl on the river so they saw his shawl and he started walking on the river walking on water David King David man in the 1100s and this is a first-hand account written by Rabbi Benjamin of the Dua. in the 1100s remember Anatoly for said that this JC that JC based on astronomical signs, was actually born in 1154 AD. Now you got the same 1100s, Benjamin talking about this Messiah, King David, walking on water. Body bag, Daniel. Body bag for the illusion. Let's get this last part for the dismount, man. What he do, tribe up. I hop to y'all, man. Y'all making this, you know what I'm saying, truly, you know, an honor. You know what I mean? Your energy your crystallization every day, every week, live in the ether, man, are making this crystallization process honorable, an honor to be a part of, man. You're making it worth 
a thousand lifetimes, man. You know what I'm saying? So much a hop to y'all for giving us purpose, for increasing our sight, our vision. Again, we are dragons on the wall. <laughs> Who is Preston John? Let's get it. So, you know, what do you say? Oh yeah. Oh man, he said, we want all these, all these, all these nagas sent out of the country, or else the remedy would be worse than the disease. Now, now you're the, now see how they flip it. That's how the hijack things. They flip it. It's just how they do. That's that's the program. It's my house. You're the plague. You're the disease. Or else the remedy would be worse than the disease. And it is feared that these Negroes, that those Negroes that get free, if there not be some strict course taken by them, with them by authority, they will be a plague to this country. No Southern plantation owner could have provided a clear statement to show how innate distaste for slavery among Anglo-Saxon was overcome by an even greater distaste for racial mingling. Indeed, one of the earliest North American slave laws on record was passed in Massachusetts in 1641 that it makes with an ultimately, with what is ultimately the same point, saying that, quote, there shall never be any bond slavery, villainage, or captivity amongst us. And this is in 1641. There shall never be any bond slavery villainage or captivity amongst us unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars. Oh, it's like that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like that in the fine print. Unless we have a just war, now you have somebody's interpretation to deal with on what is just and fair, right? Hijack 101. Or such strangers as willingly sell themselves, indentured servants, or are sold to us. So if you're sold to us, yeah, it's all good. You got sold to us. In other words, you went and bought you some slaves. These people are twisted, man. Twisted. And that's 1641. One could not keep one's own in perpetual servitude, neither according to the Old Testament nor English custom. So you can't enslave your own people. Right? Okay. So you know that, you know what I'm saying, our people that were sent out of Africa, they didn't do that to their own people. You know that, right? Huh. Okay, let's go. According to the Old Testament or English custom, but on the other hand, the Bible, Aristotle, and current international law all allow the enslavement of strangers. Well, in the script, if you got, you know, put into slavery, you can be redeemed, right? You, you can be bought out. You know what I'm saying? Or you can, you know, volunteer and say, I'll work for you for this and this and this. And this ain't got nothing to do with the chattel slavery. This is just the hijack mentality to try to apply using script their madness. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we can justify slaughtering y'all. Because see, look what happened in Jeremiah. Well, is <laughs> are, you, are you telling me that this is your land and you're fighting for your home based on your birthright? No. Well, then you can't use Jeremiah. You can't use Isaiah, and you can't use Hebrew prophets to justify slaving Hebrews. Twisted, man. So they can enslave strangers. That is to say, for Massachusetts in 1641, Negroes and Indians. So both Negroes and Indians are classified as strangers. Ain't that so? In other words, from the standpoint of the Massachusetts General Court in 1641, it was permissible to enslave racial outsiders when they fell as captive labor into your hands. And from the standpoint of John Saffin in 1701, it was more than desirable to keep them enslaved. But clearly, as far as descent New Englanders of that era, likely Samuel Seawall were concerned, the best thing to do was not let them into your midst in the first place. And this, above all, is what New England was able to do relative to the South, in no way superior to the latter on either the issue of slavery or that of race. New England was able to resist a large-scale influx of black slaves, partly out of the unreadiness, both moral and topographical, in basis to enter into the in basis to enter into the kind of cash crop economy that was condu condu condu
conductive, conducive to such an influx and partly out of the greater unwillingness to admit strangers for any reason whatsoever. In the South, on the other hand, once Virginia had made its choice for a tobacco economy and Maryland had followed suit after its founding in 1631, a choice deplored by such an outstanding Virginian as the historian Robert Beverly, as late as 1705, they had to go the way of the mass importation of cheap labor, a way that seems in the whole variety of settings in which it presents itself in that era to have led all but inexorably into a slave system. For a while, this could still mean enslaving Indians as well as blacks, but in the long run, even in situations in which there were none of the moral qualms about enslaving Native Americans that some settlers felt, Indians simply were not available in the vast qualities that the markets desired and that the international trade in blacks was able to fulfill. They couldn't make promises on something they couldn't keep because they couldn't promise that they're going to get you as a captive because you're still fighting. You weren't voluntarily saying, hey, here's 10,000 voluntary Nagas every, every week. You know what I mean? No, they had to go and fight. And in that fight, most likely somebody had to die. You didn't surrender. There was no surrender with you. Remember the Scottish Arbor Row 1320 left to hire Mark? Love to the Templar man for reading that every night. Templar reads the 432 one drop declaration. I suggest you go check it out because it lets them know, man, as long as there's a hundred of us left, as long as there's a hundred of us left in the Scottish Arbor Row 1320, as long as there's a hundred of us left, we would never fall under English rule. We would never fall under English captivity as long as there's a hundred of us left. And that was the, that was the heart bone of the Naga. So how can you guarantee that, that you're gonna have a thousand Naga slaves when they say that they ain't, they ain't gonna go down, you know what I'm saying, like no chumps. They ain't gonna go down like no chumps, man. So even if you do fight and win, then you're gonna have to kill them. Now, now what's that gonna, is that economical? So it's just not economical to promise you're gonna have some Indian slaves when you're gonna have to kill our ass. Bondage? That's, you know what I'm saying? We come from another energy, man. It's not easy for us to, to, to be slaves. You gotta, you're gonna have to bring some people over here to do that. And you know it's dangerous to enslave us on our own land and our own habitat. And we wake up to now, we wake up right now, from that time to now, and say, man, America is tribal. We hijack free. You over here chilling in Beverly Hills, you over here chilling in Manhattan, you're doing your thing. America's tribal. And it's all good, just don't stand in the tribe's way. When tribes go tribal, when the Naga goes Naga and the Indian goes Indian, don't get in that Indian's way, don't get in the Naga's way. It's ordained by Hawa, it's ordained by the Creator for us to wake up on our own land. Stop trying to take our identity away. That's your ass, man. That's your ass. Because you know the truth. And they know the truth. And that's why they put it in the damn definition of an American. In the damn definition, it says the copper color race is found here because they want you to know that this is your birthright. That there's so many of us here. We are the definition of an American. We are the Khan dynasty. Let's get this last sentence right here by Robert Beverly's time it was possible for him to predicate without qualification that slaves are the Negroes even though there were in fact still a few Indian slaves in the colony distinguishing them from the servants who did not serve in perpetuity per perpetuity forever perpetual slavery and presumably all were white but for Beverly as for his New England contemporary Saffin and Seawall, there is an implied distaste for both sides of the equation, Negro and slave, a subtle condemnation. Condemnation by who? The parasite? Who gives you the right to condemn? On foreign soil. A subtle condemnation of an entire alien complex, right? We're alien. This is foreign. 
That's why they call it a new world, Naga. You need to get out the mind of an hijack and stop claiming Africa as an old world when this is the old world. Who, who does it benefit to teach you since you're one day old that you come from Africa? Why is it that racist Tommy on the corner can say, Naga, go back to Africa. How does racist Tommy know the drop? And my most qualified scholar today, my most qualified conscious Naga today can say, Naga, y'all, y'all crazy talking this American talk. We all come from Africa. I've read all the books. Wait, 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 wait. Racist Tommy is right? And my, and my melanated scholar is right? How is that possible? How can they both be right? How did racist Tommy get on your level of scholarship? You need to be careful when you're agreeing with racist Tommy on such important matters. Maybe racist Tommy got it backwards and maybe you're in the mind of racist Tommy. There is an implied distaste for both sides of the equation, Negro and slave, a subtle condemnation of the entire alien complex that the white North American colonists, invaders, invasion invaders had accepted into his body politic from Iberian hands. Oh, you're talking about the Moors, right? That he considered unclean. Blackness and slavery both are symptoms of the infection. Blackness is a symptom, symptom of our infection, right? And they're cursed by the sun. So if my black skin uh, keeps me from getting uh, skin cancer, you know what I'm saying? If I don't have to use sunblock because I can be, you know, charged up naturally by a natural chemical process that they are putting and actually separating us from with something called Naga lace, Naga lace, my Naga. They're lacing you with Naga lace in your vaccines. Look it up. N-A-G-A-L-A-S-E, Naga lace. What does Naga lace do? When you get your uh, your uh, your vaccine, right? Because because you want to be healthy around other people. Well, your nagalase separates your GCMAF compound, which is your microphage activating factor. When you get your GCMAF separated, you had no longer have the ability to be healed naturally by the sun. So all your sickness and common colds and disease, you, it takes down your your uh, protective shields. It lowers your shields. I mean, doesn't that sound like some uh, chaotic thinking? You know, if somebody that, it's a frequency war, right? What do you think these cell phone towers are doing? What do you think your cell phones and these technologies are doing? It's lowering your defenses. It lowers your shields. It separates your GCMAF. Your MAF is your microphage activation, activating factor. If you don't activate, what happens? You're no longer gods amongst men, right? You're no longer, you know what I'm saying, in your dragon body. You can't be healed anymore. They're separating you and they're putting it in vaccines. And those independent doctors, you know what I mean? They're getting off left and right. They're coming up missing left and right for trying to tell you, you know what I mean, this truth and actually, you know, creating anti, you know what I'm saying, serums or whatever to replace your GCN MAF. They know how to put it back together. And now that they know how to put your activation back together, they're being killed for. You look it up. You get the drop. Remember, man, we are dragons on the wall. Remember, man, we are Preston John, Drop Nation. Remember, man, we are 432, one drop. A high for keeping our lights on. A high for keeping the water flowing. And a high for keeping them logs on the fire. Drop Nation.